Well, before I get rolling, I need to ask a couple of questions of all of you. And I need you to raise your arms up. I need to see some energy from you and say yes if you agree with what I say. So this is an opportunity for you to use a little energy and engage with me for a second. First of all, would you agree that there's more business to be done on a healthy living planet versus a dying dead planet? Kind of a no-brainer, right? How about if corporations we've been talking about provided unadulterated, complete transparency about everything they make and sell in their supply chain, on the shelves of the grocery stores, everything you find? Do you think you could make more informed, educated, responsible buying decisions every day of the week? Okay, two for two. <laughs> do you think that companies would do better if they, entreated, if they treated their employees well, they treated their factory workers well, provided gra gratitude and mindfulness and all the things we talked about today, compassion, soul, that they had a happier workforce? Would they do better? <laughs> okay, my speech is over. We're gonna go over to Hick and Looper's bar and have a couple drinks. So I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> now, this is what I wanted to talk to you about today. It is this complete transparency in the supply chain that is coming. It has been coming. A lot of speakers are going to talk about it today. It is the next revolution in business. And the company that I work for, Patagonia, has been driving this for a number of years. And we hope to, to really lead in this and to share it with other companies. So um, a little bit about the company. Um, Yvonne and Melinda Chenard are the owners of Patagonia. The company's in Ventura, California, and I live in Colorado and commute back and forth. And these two people are, have been great role models in my life, real mentors for me. Uh, Melinda's really the social conscious of the company. She's the one who instilled childcare so that every one of her friends could have a job at the company. And Yvonne, he's the real environmental vision, one of, one of the most um, visionary in the world, I would say. And, their mission statement from the very beginning has been to inspire and influence so solutions to the environmental crisis. And we also make a lot of nice apparel, and we try to do it with the least amount of harm. Um, I got started with Patagonia years ago. I shot photos for their catalogs, and they paid me quite generously and gave me free clothes to ski, and as a matter of fact, they still do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice bonus. But you, many of you know about the company. We were the first to give away 1% of our sales to small grassroots environmental causes. We uh, pioneered a whole supply chain of organic cotton in the mid-90s, which we gave to other companies to share with them. And we figured out how to make fleece jackets out of recycled pop bottles, which is kind of neat. Um, when I joined the company in 2005, we had an idea that we were going to have all of our clothing by 2010 completely recycled and recyclable. We didn't make that goal. We got close. We got about 70% of the way there. And in fact, by fall of 11, I think we'll be almost all the way there. But we set a new goal for ourselves. And this was to, uh, by 2015, have all of our apparel completely out of landfills. So if you bought a Patagonia jacket, it would never get thrown away. And what we wanted to do is kind of unorthodox, and it's not unlike the uncommon culture of Patagonia, is we wanted you first to buy less stuff from us. Okay? Now, there's a lot of other things we're going to do, but think about that, because we have to do our job as a company to make really durable, multifunctional apparel that you're not going to want to throw away. And if you do throw it away, or not throw it away, but give it away, We'll help you with that. You can obviously give it to the Salvation Army. We may find ways to help you sell it on the online community to somebody like eBay or somebody like that. We just don't want it to leave the cycle at all. Now, if the product is completely shot, a zipper pulls out, we'll repair it. That's fine. And at the end of its life, if it absolutely won't work anymore, we'll, we have ways of repairing nylons, polyesters, cottons. We can, we can recycle all those items back into new garments. And finally, because we've been talking here tonight how humans today are far outstripping the needs of up to seven planets, just this little population of people that's here now, we want to reimagine a world that sustains us all. 
So I want to tell a little story about my boss, Yvonne Chouinard, that dirtbag climber, surfer, fly fisherman. He got invited to go speak at Walmart and to help Walmart figure out a way to reduce their manufacturing footprint. And um, I was one, in one of the earlier meetings with some of the Walmart guys and the Sam's Club guys, and I just got to thinking, this could be one of the biggest opportunities of, of our company's whole future. Because here's Yvonne talking to a company which scale a thousand times ours, telling them to get their act together. And I remember these stories that were being told in these meetings. We'd heard a story that, that Walmart's buyers had asked General Mills to reduce the cardboard packaging around their hamburger helper. Hamburger Helper came with new packaging. They took the air and they took cardboard out of it. Well, guess what? They reduced 795,000 pounds of cardboard out of what they shipped to Walmart that year, and they put 500 semi-trucks off the road for an entire year. Now, this isn't all altruistic because they saved a hell of a lot of money in shipping costs, too. And you think about you know, the movement that they've, they've, things they've done about you know, reducing laundry detergent so it's double the strength. And, but I think too about what they could do if they took three milligrams of mercury out of a, of a, a CFL bulb, it would be the equivalent of recycling 100 million light bulbs. So this scale is huge. And we estimate that they leave 30 million yards of scrap on the cutting room floor in their factories every year. So can't we do better than that? So Yvonne gives a speech. The CEO of, of Walmart gets up in front of his group, and he says, that guy was awesome. You guys got to get behind this. Guess what? If you don't embrace this initiative, many of you sitting in the room today will not be working for Walmart next year. And that was the beginning of Walmart's greening movement, which you've been hearing about in the last five years. This little company, Patagonia, stirring the stick and causing this huge ripple effect to affect this giant, giant company. And Yvonne came to me, he came back to California, he said, you know, I think that was the biggest moment in my career. I may have peaked right then, but that was the biggest moment. <laughs> <laughs> so another great thing came out of this recently. In March, we announced what's called the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And this is a group of 35 really big companies that were inspired by this moment with Walmart. And what these guys are doing um, is they're developing an index, a rating system, uh, and it kind of plays back to our, our prior speaker, talking about ways of really getting visibility into everything from manufacturing, shipping, water usage, all the different aspects of, of what happens when you make a product. So the first index will be inward facing, uh, facing into the company. And for example, a portion of it is an index that Nike ha has produced called Nike Considered, where designers are actually able to determine the impact of every single fabric material that they select when they design a shoe or a piece of footwear, or I mean a, a, a garment. Now, you think about that, that's, you gotta start there, picking good, good items. And then there's another index which is produced by the Outdoor Industry Association here in Boulder, and that kind of adds to that with all the shipping uh, ramifications, transpor transportation uh, ramifications of, of producing items. And so when they do this, they're developing a rating system they'll use internally. But my dream is that this rating will soon be in consumers' hands. So imagine this is a smartphone. I'm going to walk into the store. I'm going to purchase that, that GMO food or that healthy food or that shoe or that jacket. And I'm going to scan a barcode. And I'm going to see a rating come up on my screen from 1 to 10 as to whether that's a socially, environmentally responsible product, and it's going to tell me a lot about what actually went into making that particular product. So we've given the consumer this choice in their purchase decision about whether to buy something or not. And if they don't like it from one brand, they can go to another, and maybe they get a better rating. So that's, that's, that's big. Now, <laughs> how do we tell these stories? Well, everybody has CSR reports. Uh, corporate social responsibility reports. They're boring, they're paper, they're charts and graphs. We tried it, didn't work. For Patagonia, we tried to do things differently anyway. So we developed an online CSR report called the Footprint Chronicles. And our environmental gurus, Rick Ridgway and Jill Dumaine and our head of marketing, Rob Bondurant, um, t decided to take cameras and microphones and still cameras into the factories, talk to the workers, interview the factory owners, go see these working conditions these people are in. Some of them 
Ah, they're not so great. It's funny because everybody thinks that all the jackets and things we make at Patagonia are made in our nice little downstairs sample room. Well, the reality, we're making stuff in China, we're making stuff in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Colombia, in Central America, all over the world. So we wanted our customer to see, go into those factories and see where every single item is made and talk to those workers and find out what, what it's like to work there. This has shifted our entire factory base. They are in this competition to create better working conditions for their people, uh, better food, better dormitories. It's unbelievable. There's a factory in Vietnam that it, it's like, you know, it's like the Ramada Inn down here in town. It's beautiful. Um, so, so I'm psyched to see this, this happen with, with, with the Footprint Chronicles, but I remember a moment when I was having doubt as a CEO, we were about to launch the, the Footprint Chronicles. We had five items. And, and Hunter Lovins was giving a speech, and you'll see her later on tonight, she's one of my environmental heroes, it was in my office the day before we were gonna launch the Footprint Chronicles. And <laughs> I said, Hunter, we're not ready. I got five items, and I'm about to open the kimono wide on Patagonia and, and tell people exactly what's going on with every single product I make. She said, well, take a deep breath, but go for it. You have to be honest. And when you, you have to start somewhere. And we did. And we got nothing but praise for, these, for this Footprint Chronicles. Now we have, I think, 17 products that are online on the Chronicles. It represents 170 of our 70 styles across all of our categories. And we're getting customer feedback about how we can be a better manufacturer. We're getting it from all over the world. So this has been fantastic. Now, we tell the good and we tell the bad. There's products in there that are horrible. I have a backpack over by my seat over here that's made with non-recycled nylon, it's virgin nylon, it's environmentally, it sucks. It's not, it would rate as zero on the scale of one to 10. But we brought awareness to this issue. We know we have a problem and we know we're gonna do something better with our pack line over time. And so we're embarrassed by that, but it, leaves, it gives us that starting point to do something else. Um, there's one other cool thing that's happening as a result of this total exposure around the supply chain. We, um, are working with some small ranches down in, in Argentina. And they, these ranches are growing merino sheep for high quality wool. And they have figured out a way to use rotational grazing to move the animals around. It's kind of like the buffalo in the American West 200 years ago where they just rattled over the landscape to 30, you know, 30 miles a day. They chewed up a little grass, but they kind of braided their way through. They didn't really cause much impact. And with the gauchos at these ranches, they're moving the animals very quickly their little hoof marks can actually capture the water that, that does fall out of the sky and maybe allow for some grasses to grow. And they drop their droppings and that creates a cycle of, of greater fertility in the land, better grass, higher protein, healthier animals. These principles came from a man named Alan Savory who's a Rhodesian biologist who was actually able to res reverse the desert situations going on in Africa. And he also saw that when the, the landscape becomes healthier, you have a lot more biodiversity. So in Argentina's sake, you have the guanaco coming back, the red fox, and as a supplier, I know where every single fiber of my wool is gonna be coming from. I didn't have that in the past. It might a little bit come from New Zealand, a little bit from Australia. Now I know it's all gonna come from Argentina, and I know the actual sheep that it's coming from. That is that extreme transparency I'm talking about that you should demand as a consumer. We all should demand and it should, be, it should apply to everything we, we eat, that we wear, that we drink, everything that's on our bodies, everything that's a part of our planet. 